David Spears, civil engineering instructor at Texas Tech University, talking about solids, CE3303. We're in chapter 13 in the textbook, which I urge you to refer to for better drawings and additional math. We're talking about column buckling. Column buckling is the failure mode of long, slender members. A column has to be really short and compact to fail under yield stress, to fail due to crushing or something like that. The way a column fails is you put a load on it, as shown in this drawing, and at some point you exceed the critical load and lateral deflection occurs. And that lateral deflection in a compressed member is called buckling. P-critical is the axial force when the column is on the verge of buckling. Now buckling is a very sudden and dramatic thing that you can't um, see coming visually, so something we as engineers want to stay way away from because it is catastrophic. So we need a method of analyzing this mysterious type behavior. So the book shows this nice idealized example of a column of height L divided in two parts with a hinge in the middle and a lateral spring uh, that acts to keep the column from buckling. So you put a, apply a load and then if you go up and push it in the middle it, the spring keeps it from going sideways, lateral deflection, and so it pushes it back to straight. As you keep on loading it, increasing the axial force P, you're cre every time you deflect it lateral, laterally, you create a, a moment that tries to buckle the column. It just gets progressively worse. But up until you get to a, a critical load, the spring force is sufficient to keep the column straight and it keeps pushing it back. So as long as that force is less than what the book derives through some math as KL over 4, where K is that spring force, the column is stable. Once P equals KL over 4, it's neutral, fixing to buckle, and it if axial force greater than KL over 4, it is unstable and the least little deflection will cause it to buckle. So, we need to get a handle on that number, on that the amount of spring force that the column's geometry and shape and uh, length provide it. So, we have a column here of height L pinned and pinned at the top and bottom and it has a cross section of I, moment of inertia. Of course we want to consider, we'll talk about it in a second, the minimum cross, -sec cross sectional moment of inertia. Just a geometric property of the column. We can do some more math and use the elastic curve and some equations for that to derive this formula here P critical is equal to pi squared E I over L squared that's Euler's load and in that E is of course Young's modulus the uh, moment of inertia I is the minimum or the smallest moment of inertia of the cross-sectional shape and L is its unsupported length now we can also refine this formula into more usable form by considering the radius of gyration R for this fact for this course and for these calculations in statics we talked about the radius of gyration which is the square root of the moment of inertia divided by the area once again we want to work with the minimum moment of inertia so we get the minimum radius of gyration 
So we rearrange that. We can say that moment of inertia is equal to the area times the radius of gyration squared. Plug that into the Euler's load formula. Get pi squared e a r squared over l squared. Can further rearrange that and get a stress, a critical stress, which is of course p over a, the axial stress. And that's pi squared e over the quantity L over R squared. L over R is what we call the slenderness ratio. The uh, slenderness ratio kind of determines whether or not it's a long slender member. And by the fact that we have E, the material property, Young's modulus in there, the L over R's that define slenderness vary some. For steel, an L over R less than 89, meaning it's short and compact, means that it will not fail as a long slender member. Yield stress does control that design. So that's what we were talking about earlier on. It's only really short compact columns ever fail from yielding. Mostly it's going to be the slenderness and, and the buckling that causes it to fail. So finally we're going to talk about a very important factor in column buckling is column support types, how it's supported top and bottom. We're going to define this effective length factor K and modify our critical load and critical stress equations by that number. Look over here it's uh, with pin pinned connections at the top and bottom the length of L, here's how it fails. Its effective length is its actual length, or really unsupported height. Its K factor is 1 for pinned pinned. If a column is fixed at the base and free at the top, it's really prone to side sway and it fails more like looking like this. Kind of drawn it uh, more, more clearly, but that it really would. Uh, stay right there and it would kind of sway over at the top. So we can idealize its effective length as twice its actual length. So its K factor for fixed free becomes 2. If it's fixed at the top and fixed at the bottom, the fixity provides some stiffness and support, reducing its effective length. It buckles like that and its uh, K factor is, effective length factor is 0.5 for fixed fix, so its effective length is 0.5 L. For pinned at the top, fixed at the bottom, or vice versa, the fixity still provides some stiffness, reduces its effective length to 0.7 L, so its K factor is 0.7. So let's say we can modify these uh, P critical from Euler's load to pi squared EI over KL quantity squared. And uh, the critical axial stress for buckling is pi squared E over KL over R squared. KL over R is referred to as the effective slenderness factor.